You're listening to the Gender Reveal Party Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Pryor. This isn't your usual gender reveal party. There will be no baby sex parts. This is the real reveal, where we reveal gender through stories of brave humans willing to share their lived experience. Enjoy the listening. I sure enjoy making it. Welcome back to the Gender Reveal Party Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Pryor, and I can't even tell you how delighted I am to uh, share my guest with me today. We've already been talking and we had to hit the record button. I am talking today to Minnie Bruce Pratt and every one of my butch brothers and my femme sisters are really, really jealous right now. <laughs> so uh, Minnie Bruce Pratt is an LGBTQ writer and activist from Alabama. She's the author of nine books of poetry, creative nonfiction, and political theory, and she's a managing editor of Workers, Work, Workers World Mundo, a Brero newspaper, and I, you know, hardly any of that stuff is why I want to talk to you, right? <laughs> because to me, who you are, Minnie Bruce Pratt, is like the queen of femmes. Like, you are the high femme of all high femmes, <laughs> and I, I just want to oh, like... Again bow to you or something because <laughs> my little butch self is going freaking out um so i'm so excited to be with you thank you so much for being with us oh yeah oh. delighted delighted thank you thank you jay thank you um i have to say i'm very flattered and also you know nostalgic for leslie because of you know um just the way she was with me around uh you know when you're a femme woman of whatever your sexuality might be right you just grow up in so much woman hatred and you know compliments that are really putting you down when they don't when when they supposedly you're supposed to be complimenting you and um when I got together with Leslie, she was the first lover that I had ever had who really honored my complexity of my womanhood. Yeah. And it was because, and I'll say she, I, I should say something about pronouns right now. Yeah. I've, you know, I've always wondered what Leslie's pronouns were. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let like me just switched. stop. I'll, I'll continue this anecdote in just a minute. Yeah. Well, or let me finish the anecdote, I guess, <laughs> and then I'll do pronouns. Um, she honored me, and it was because she had she had dealt with her own gender complexity. Right. She had dealt with her own life as a very complexly gendered person who had had her own share of violence and hatred. Um, but specifically around her masculinity, right? The way. She, the way she expressed masculinity and and her sexuality and the fact that she was a, was attracted to femmes um, and no and knew and also because of her early life in the early bars in Buffalo and she knew a lot about the, the oppression of women. Mm -hmm. All of the women in those bars were not did not identify as lesbian. A lot of them were asexual or they made their living with sex work and you know, she understood firsthand what, what, what femme women were going through. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And, and that, and that she never underestimated me. She used to say, I pity the man who ever lays a hand on me. He, <laughs> he would draw it back a bleeding stump. <laughs> <laughs> because of course I'm so angry, so angry. And she, always understood femme anger you yeah. know right so let yeah. me say something about pronouns because i know people wonder about pronouns actually even though the new york times obituary that they ran of her was deficient in in a lot of ways in terms of honoring her political life they did get the correct quote about the pronouns and the quote from leslie was something like um People have honored me with the wrong pronoun and disrespected me with the right pronoun, right? So her preferred pronouns, and, and, and this is in the 
obituary that she and I wrote together before she died to make sure it was the way she wanted it to be. The pronouns she identified with were she and her. And because we were lesbian lovers, that's how we, that's how I talk about her, right? Yeah. But also Z and here as more gender neutral. And I'm sure that, you know, that was 2013 when we wrote that. So there, there might be something else now in terms of gender neutral, right? Right. That, 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 that Leslie might use, but some kind of gender neutral pronoun, right? right. Um, and, and it's significant, I think, that people should know because sure. that it was never he or him. Got it. But, Got when, it. but, but if people used it as an honoring of Leslie, like right. if we were in, um, if we went to a social event, for instance, we did this once, we went to a, a potluck on the Jersey shore of cross-dressers, people who mm. heterosexual cross-dressers, right? Mm. Wow. So um, the male bodied people were cross-dressed as female and used their pronouns she and her. Mm -hmm. And they, honoring Leslie as a cross-dresser, mm -hmm who was female bodied, but right. cross-dressed as in a masculine way, called Leslie he right. and him. Right. And that was socially, that was like a socially appropriate and honoring right. pronoun. And, yeah. and really I would say that was what Leslie emphasized more than anything that pronouns shift in terms of social context. I love that. And what is the intent of right. the person? Right. Is it to disrespect you or is it to honor you? Right. And, you know, we've had, uh, there's a group of, of people that I have kind of been friends with online and, and been in groups with where we have a, have a butch femme gather. We used to have butch femme gatherings. We've had butch femme bashes. We called them past reunions, things like that. And in those circles, the butches and those of us who are TG butch or um, all use he. Um, with each other as butches um, mm -hmm, just because mm -hmm. it's a brotherhood you know it's right. like a, a real brotherhood um, and most of those butches um, use she pronouns outside of that circle um, right but the he right. pronoun is very powerful and before we go any further I want to make sure that because a lot of our audience is um, you know cisgender straight people who don't know anything about what we're talking about <laughs> so I want to I want to back up a little bit and a lot of them have um at least know my story. And I was sharing with you before that Leslie's book, uh, Stone Butch Blues, changed my life. And when I speak and I tell my story, I tell the story all the time where I, I was kind of faking or doing my best to cover up and present as Les Butch in the world, in academia and in college. And I meet this femme and she sends me the book Stone Butch Blues. And, and right then and there, I threw out all my girl clothes and I <laughs> went back to call myself Jay and right. uh, at the time. And Leslie even came to uh, KU actually to speak. Oh, I remember. Yes. Yeah. And I met Leslie and, it, and for years I would felt shame about this. It's so funny because I had my sister with me and at the time I wasn't out to my sister in that way and I was afraid. And so when I went up to have my book signed, I asked, I, you know, Leslie asked me, who do I sign this to? And I wanted to say Jay. And I said, Janet, which is my birth name. And um, I had shame or felt regret about that for many years because I always wanted my book to be signed to Jay. But now that I've come back to more of a non-binary place and I'm feeling my old lesbian oats now that I've gone off testosterone, um, <laughs> I'm really grateful that I have it signed to Janet because I really have gone full circle in wanting to honor that part of that, that, that self of mine. Um, but when I speak, I tell people all the time, um, and I say it every single time. So I say your name every t single time I speak that you put Leslie's book as a free PDF online after she died. And yeah. I, so I tell people, go get it, go, yeah. go read this book. It's free. And I tell, especially young queers, like you have to go read this book because it's part of yeah, your history. Good. Um, good. Tell me about that. Like that was a, that was a, was that something you decided before or you just. Oh no, oh no, no, no. It was all Leslie. I mean, I, I did the work. I did some of the work, not all the work. Um, you know, Leslie was sick for a long time. Yeah. 
a long time. In fact, you know, it was a Lyme co-infection really that, that killed her, babesiosis, which is like having malaria, yeah. the kind of malaria. Um, and if it isn't caught soon enough, it will kill you. And she probably was infected long before anybody understood any of this, like in the seventies, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so she was sick off and on, uh, you know, every, uh, from that time on. But when we got together, then she was, became increasingly ill, uh, really only a few years into our relationship. So we talked about death a lot because there were a lot of times when we thought she wasn't going to make it. Yeah. Um, and we lived, we just lived to be with each other, you know, no matter what. Yeah. But what it meant is that she did have to think about what would happen with her work after she died. And by the time she was really ill in the, um, you know, 2011, 2012. And so, um, like increasingly, we were increasingly, we, we had had to move to upstate New York where I had a teaching job because she was not well enough to live by herself in Jersey City, which was where we had made our home for many, many, many years. Right. So Leslie was thinking about all of this because by then she certainly understood how important Stonebridge Close was historically. Yes. Right. Yes. She, she certainly understood it. I mean, she wrote it I'm and so it glad. was published in 95. And so now we're talking about, you know, 20 years later, 30, right. 20 years yeah. later. So, um, and, and Leslie was a communist. I mean, she was, she, her last words to, to me were, remember me as a revolutionary communist. And those words weren't just to me. She understood that we would write about her after her death and that it was important that her last words be those words. So people, when they think about her work being available to them online, have to put it in that context. And in the... In the the new edition that's online, she actually, I know you know this, she actually wrote at length about what it meant to return the book to the people yes. from where it came. Yeah. I mean, literally from, I mean, this yeah. working class butch who came out of bar life with other working class queer people and then was able to write about that with the, inside of somebody who trained to be a revolutionary too. Yeah. She, and so people should go to lesliefeinberg.net and read not just the book, mm -hmm. but her comments, because she talks about taking it out, taking the book out of the profit-making system right. and returning it to the commons meaning yeah. the commons that belong to hope that should belong to all of us. Right. There's not a lot of it left, but Leslie's book is in the commons now. Right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and people should also know because of her um, and anybody who speaks other languages should know this. Certainly anybody who um, th she has a section on translations yeah, and there great. are stipulations about if you want to translate the book and people should read that because it's now in uh, Basque online. It's up in Basque, it's up in French, it's soon gonna be up in Spanish. Nice. Um, maybe th there was an Italian translation that is out of print and hopefully somebody's gonna bring it back in Italian. It was translated into German, into Serbian, into Hebrew with all the prophets going to um, the uh, Palestine, um, queer women's organization um, into Chinese, uh, that, that edition, you know, I wish I had that to put up online, but it's, it's there, a lot of this stuff happened some years ago and we sure. never, we never got our hands on the translations. Yeah. Um, but I'm continuing that work. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm actually, yesterday I was at the computer 
dealing with more translation correspondence. You know, somebody is doing it in Portuguese. So it's not just going to be up in English for the world, but it's right. going to be up in all these different. And people are translating Transgender Warriors, the book, uh -huh. which is Leslie's Marxist theory, the first ever about what, how trans identities arose uh, out of in out of the earliest communal life right right before there was gender oppression right you know yeah right so there's just a lot at lesliefeinberg.net people should check that out for sure thank you and we'll put that as a link uh to the in the show notes things like that so yeah thank you for sharing that so tell me what do you make of you know where you in she started out and where and your experience of your whole life right given all that you know about gender not just the, in your own experience but you've studied about gender and now we are to the point where my kid came out to me as trans at the age of 10 and i have an interview with uh debbie jackson who works for hrc her child came out to her at the age of four and we're able to socially transition that child. Um, and, you know, we have the, and then now, now my kid came out as trans, but then once hit middle school is now non-binary and all the pronouns and this gender thing right. is hooey right. and right. it's a bunch of hooey, right? Um, and, and that's why I'm doing the show for the most part is because we, I want to move us there, but boy, have you, you've had a, a front row seat to all this. I'd love to hear your, I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I've definitely had a front row seat. Definitely yeah. all the, all the way. But I think the first thing I would say is I think the, 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 the phenomena that we're in the middle of, of the children claiming their identities simply shows us how completely um, embedded in both nature and human culture, gender variance is. For sure. If it is not repressed by uh, mean people and, yeah. and state forces, if you don't repress it, then the, it's going to emerge because mm -hmm. it's part of, of the human experience and part of the, the human um, yearning, right? You know, and and you just don't know which way people are going to go, and they make <laughs> no. and they change over time depending on what options are available to them. Mm -hmm. As we were talking before we started, before we hit the record <laughs> button, you know. Um, so if you look at you know the the research and 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 anecdotes and and still existing. Um, uh, existing expressions in indigenous cultures, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, there have always been gender variant people in those always. cultures. And there were social roles available to them mm -hmm. that were respected. Right. Right. So that as people emerged into, you know, their being, then they would gravitate toward whatever social role fit best with them. Right. Um, and those are in all human cultures. Mm -hmm. All human cultures, there's some residue, even no matter how repressed that culture might be. And we're seeing once we lifted the lid with our liberation struggles of the of the 50s and 60s and 70s, then it's like, yes, it was all there anyway. It was right. just repressed and beaten and shamed and raped and everything, right. but it was there. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you grew up in this small town. I grew up in this small town. There were gender variant people everywhere and there everywhere. were queer people everywhere and everybody knew who they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then absolutely. they would just talk about them and, you know, well, she just likes women too much, you know, <laughs> or, oh, poor Jamie Meggs. Oh, but he's so sweet. He's so sweet. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah right so in right. the small towns there was some room even though there was pity mm -hmm. right but like yeah. here, so here's an example of my life who was my first boyfriend when I was 14 or 15 I, I don't know you know about 14 15 I was completely femmed out right um Benny Lee Nash the son of a coal miner 
um, I remember sitting on the porch of his, they lived in an apartment building in my town. It was the only apartment building on town square, one little building with like a couple of floors and a porch on the second floor and the front first floor. And I remember sitting there in the summer with him. We never talked to each other. I, you know, this is like looking back. Mm -hmm. We never talked to each other. We just kind of were around each other. I don't think we ever held hands. We certainly never kissed, but he gave me a birthday present you know we were briefly boyfriend and girlfriend well what happens later on in life Benny Lee comes out as gay <laughs> he's the first editor of the first gay newspaper in Alabama mm. wow. the Alabama forum right mm -hmm. I don't see him I don't learn this for years I don't see right. him for years when I see him again I think oh my god no wonder we were together he's this little femme guy <laughs> he's, he's like he was like another femme right. and we were hanging out as femme as queer femmes together right right I love it yeah right so but no language no understanding but gravitating right Mm -hmm. And, you know, my best girlfriend, again, no sexual, no, nothing sexual between us, except under deeply, you know, deep currents of something. We were in the percussion section in our band. All the queer people were in the band. You know, <laughs> then you didn't have to be a football player. You didn't have to be a majorette, right? Right. So all the queer people were in the band. And Lila and I were in the percussion section together. And we used to do snare drums duets with each other for all state competition and what i remember most vividly is us side by side wailing the hell out of the drums together mm -hmm. very complicated rhythmically you know the music mm -hmm. actually came out of it been a mississippi where it came out of a black historically black college in mm -hmm. it so you know that's the other part of this reminiscence with you, which sure. is, you know, we were in, we were segregated, all of mm -hmm. us queer folks, we were segregated mm -hmm. from the other queer folks who were African American. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, and then the civil rights movement, and then the anti war movement, and then the women's liberation movement. And in the South, as elsewhere, the lid was being lifted and language was being given mm -hmm. to answer the repression and to fight the repression, which was legal. I mean, I think it's also the thing that people tend to just not know. Right. Segregation was legal. Right. No one was punished for lynching black people. Right. It was a crime to have sex with the same person of your same gender under the crime against nature statutes. You could be, when I, when I was leaving my husband and I went to a lawyer because he threatened to take the children. I went to a lawyer in Raleigh, North Carolina. I said, can he really do this? She took the statute book down off the shelf and she read me the crime against nature statute. that so said something like, not less than two or more than 30 years and you know for the crime against nature wow you know i mean that that's in my you know that was 19 1975 in north carolina not not that long ago so all of this repression was legal and we we fought it and we defeated it. And by the we, I mean the big we. Yeah. I mean the interconnected Black civil rights struggle, Black national struggle, lesbian, gay, queer struggle, women's liberation struggle, pro-abortion struggle. All of it was interlinked. Not everybody was involved in everything, but together it was a mighty, mighty force. Mm -hmm. And it opened the way to, you know, me finding Leslie, Leslie writing a book, you getting Leslie's book, us being here together. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that ripple just keeps on going, going out. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about language because, um, you know, 
I love the word queer and you've been using the word queer throughout. I got accused recently of single-handedly pushing the word queer onto my community. And I, of course, stood up and took a bow for that. (laughs) (laughs) Hell yeah, I did. (laughs) But I love that word queer. And and I've, you know, when I came out in 1985, I was 18 in 1985 when I came out and I immediately embraced the word butch dyke. Like for me, being a butch dyke was like who I was. And it was the first thing that was like, oh, wow, I'm home, right? And um, then queer for me has always been that way. It's like queer is who I'm queer, <laughs> no matter. And especially now, I mean, I'm either a, uh, you know, a, a woman with a beard and no breasts or a man with a vulva. So, I mean... I'm a queer. <laughs> There's nothing, right, nothing about right. that. Right. So I love the word queer. You use it a lot. But boy, do we get pushback and especially from uh, older, older, older gay and, le- gay and lesbian people. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, I honestly don't have much experience. With. I mean, I am an older lesbian person, <laughs> but right. I really uh, but uh, I have to say when I got to, when Leslie and I got, well, you know, all my, all of my lovers have been gender non-conforming people. Right. Including the man I married for that matter. Right. right? I mean, that was my sexual attraction. Right. Clearly that boundary, that, that shifting boundary around the sex and gender was something, is something that has always attracted me both right. personally, but also as a vision mm-hmm. of what life could be. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I got together with Leslie, was at the cusp of that historical moment. So this would have been 1992. And the lesbian community was going through some upheaval around um, the, you know, sort of the old, uh, older um, cultural scene uh, of the, of the sixties and seventies. Um, the Barnard Conference uh, fights over what could be discussed at that conference around sex and mm-hmm. sexual practice and butch femme and so forth. That was kind of a watershed moment, you know, of, right. of struggle. Um, and so I, it's not that I left my community that I had been part of, but it's, it's like they just weren't um, the the uh, sort of the the lesbian feminist community that that I had been that had come up in 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 the South, right? Um, well, and I, I don't want to even say that because um, you know I think the South had a lot more understanding of gender queerness than other parts of the country. Right. I felt less there was a lot less resistance there in certain ways but there was there was resistance among people who identified as lesbian feminist to this new uh permeability around gender right Mm -hmm. and but it was but um so i don't know about the lesbian gay community i'm thinking more of the women's the women's community and 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 it turns it it ended up being a very retrograde and a very regressive and a very backward development that current, because of course you can never revert to biological determinism and be on the forward edge of progressive life. Right. You know, like yeah. scientific racism should have taught us that and you can't <laughs> do it around gender either. And we see the outcome of it in all of these terrible laws that right. are, are saying you know, there's only the only two sexes and, you know, all this anti, it's totally anti-scientific in the best sense of the word of science, mm-hmm. you know. So um, uh, the older lesbian gay community, I, I don't know. I, I don't know who you're hanging out with <laughs> because <laughs> I feel like I, well, I, I, know, I know those struggles. I've been in those struggles and I've also seen them go down. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that really, like here in Syracuse, I know there was a very intense struggle before I, we moved here when we weren't part of the community and they actually had Leslie come and talk mm. about these issues. Right. Because there were, you know, 
lesbians who were fighting it tooth and nail. Right. And they yeah. they had to throw in the towel. Yeah, lesbians and gay people were the most uh, violent in their language anyway toward me whenever I decided to take testosterone or yeah. you know, that whole switch. Um, and yeah, I yeah. did the same thing. I just came to my community and I actually booked a talk and just showed up and keep showing up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I feel like we've had those ready. battles and most, and a lot of them have been won. Yeah, I agree. A lot of them have been won. And the and I do think it is a generate, it's the people of a certain generation who, for whatever reason in their own life, maybe have just not ever really taken a good look around. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> about, about how, I mean, I think about my mama, my mama who was married to my father for like 45 years or something and, and completely thought I was going to hell because I was a lesbian. Right. And I, and yet when she met these lesbian friends of mine, lesbians of color, friends of mine in Washington, DC, we had, they, I asked her over for tea. We had tea at their house. And when she went home, they said, Minnie Bruce, why didn't you tell us your mama was a big old butch dyke? <laughs> well, You're like, uh... <laughs> yeah, right. And then I look at her and I think, oh my God, yeah, she's wearing men's clothes. She, she's talking about how cute that brunette is. And, but she never, you know, she didn't have any consciousness or, connection you know in her own body I guess maybe right you know? well and there's that weird world of gender and then sexual orientation and how they do and don't dance together right and, exactly and exactly that, she was a big country let she was a big country butch woman you know right. and and but I also thought there was something there you know around her friendship with other women she came from a 19th century world that was um sex segregating no 100 percent. yeah you know yeah. so that's like that's a whole other conversation like <laughs> it is a how you live in different historical periods and your desire evolves in different historical periods yeah yeah and even for myself i feel like i've you know i was born in this i was born in 66 i came in kind of came out as a butch dyke in 85 and then in a, like you were talking about you, I, if I were to say, and I would tell people I was a butch in 1991, 92, when I went back to school, or if I was being friendly with a young butch and said, Hey, who's the, you know, cause the first time somebody saw me and said, who's the new baby butch, I was home. I right. was like home. Right. 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 But in 1992, if I saw a young person and I called them, like, I remember one time very specifically this young butch in my world was carrying seven suitcases and her femme was walking in front of her with her purse and I said I said something like easy baby but or something like you know something about your young butch or something like that and it was a an affection and then, yeah and of course and then the the funniest part about it, it was like I'm not a butch <laughs> Like, it's like, well, that's too bad because I am and I love being a butch you know it's like yeah, that's that's yeah. that's I'm sorry that you don't you know that somehow that's turned into a bad thing yeah you. yeah and it really had turned into something like you can't call me don't call me a butch or you're not yeah it's, don't be butchy or whatever that is and i yeah, was like I, yeah. I am i'm a butch <laughs> and yeah. i love femmes and so then it took a long time for me to find uh it was before before i uh got the book around that same time is when i started finding butch femme communities online right and right that's how we found each other and and at the time i was the only self-identified butch that I knew about in my town and at that time I was here in Lawrence and a hundred thousand oh, people in Lawrence yeah. yeah right and that was a 97 yeah, yeah. but a liberal but a liberal university town see I think so much of this also has to do with region oh and, yeah for sure you know yeah. like what kinds of like you know when I came out in the bars in North Carolina and what year was that well I came out in 75 so you know the other the first bar i went to was called the other side <laughs> it was the other side of the railroad tracks in <laughs> Fayetteville, north carolina nice yeah yeah but you know i think you know small town southern life that's one thing or even small town kansas life right mm -hmm. yeah um and then 
liberal towns that had been in university towns that had been injected with feminist theorizing. I mean, I remember I had this conversation with Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first conversations we had on the phone, I think, um, she had left me a message. I had, I had met her and she had left me a phone message and she said in the message, how glad she was to see, see a film from the old days in the audience. So I, so then we started a correspondence and I wrote back to her and I said, well, actually I'm not from the old days. I, you know, I came out in, as a, into lesbian feminism in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, you know, Fayetteville, which is not exactly liberal North Carolina to say the least. Um, but then as we talked further, I told her about the other side, the bar, right? Mm -hmm. My yeah. first bar, right? Well, the other side had an entrance so narrow that we had to sign, we had to stand in this entrance between the counter and the cigarette machine. It's it like as narrow as this computer mm -hmm. and sign in, you had to join, it, had, it was a private club. You had to right. join for a dollar, you know how that worked, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And, then, and then you had to sign your name and we all signed fake names. right? Right. I would sign in as Susan B. Anthony. And, <laughs> and then, um, so I said to them once, why don't you make this wider? We're having to stand in the street to get in and we don't, that's really not okay. And they said, oh, no, no, we have to keep it narrow like this to block the CID. This was the army, F, you know, the army police, right? right? The CID. We have to keep it narrow so we can delay the CID when they come to raid the bar. Right. Because it's Fayetteville, North Carolina, it's Fort Bragg. It's right. Um, right. And 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 indeed, there was a back, there was a back door. I knew where the back door was. You know, it was you there's a dance floor and the pool room in the back door, right? Right. So I, just, I don't know. I told all that to Leslie, and Leslie said to me very indulgently, <laughs> she said, Mini Bruce. <laughs> Anybody who knows about the back door is a them from the old days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was yeah. like a shock to me. It was like I had this dual identity. It was right. like lesbian feminist, TALF, triangle area lesbian feminist, alpha, Atlanta lesbian, you know, Atlanta area lesbian and Atlanta lesbian feminist alliance. I had that. And then I had this like North Carolina bar sexual life mm -hmm. not theoretical life right right yeah so you know that took me took me a while to figure out not very long though yeah, not very long <laughs> not long <laughs> like which way am i gonna go right am yeah, i gonna right. follow my cunt or am i gonna like <laughs> you know stay in the textbook <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> oh my god where is the real adventure where's the theory where does the theory come from right 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 yeah yeah so your latest book which you sent me and i appreciate it so much um I, I i i said this in my note to you that i'm not a scholar and honestly poetry usually like either bores me or i don't get it like i'm always like I always feel stupid when I read it because I'm always like, I don't even know what the hell they're talking about <laughs> like most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you that. And I've been reading a couple of, I haven't read you know the whole book, but I've read through some of these poems. And there's one that I turn to right off the bat that I'm kidding. I'm not kidding you. And I don't know how you're fixed or you believe around the universe or things like that. But I, I often like, I'm just, I want to open the book to see where I open the book. So I opened the book to this poem and I read this poem and I, I can't, it makes me cry a lot <laughs> and I don't get, I'm, that's unusual for me because I'm not usually like a poem person or get it most of the time, but this poem uh, really moved me. And um, I know that this book in and of itself is it, it like to say, it's almost like a novel inside of what poems is is that accurate because that's how it feels to me yeah yeah well you know it goes back to what you and i were talking about before we hit the, the record before button, we hit the record button right which is about <laughs> how people learn through story 
right. how, how, and by learn, I don't mean book learning either. Right. You know, I mean, life, like, yeah. how do you learn how to live? Yeah. Which is a really hard thing to do. It's really yeah. hard to learn how to live. As, yeah. Is this conversation a test? Mm-hmm. Um, so when I, when I started, when I started reading poetry as a teenager, which is hard to do because there were no libraries in my town. So I had to, I had to ask people's permission to go into their houses and look through their bookcases to borrow books, right? Yeah. And when I was able to find books, some of the books I found were, were books of poetry, but it was a very heavily 19th century tradition of poetry, which was extremely narrative. Mm-hmm. It was a storytelling tradition, which just suited me great, mm-hmm. you know, because I was from that culture that you learn things through story. Right. And so when I started writing poetry, then that's the kind of poetry I've been writing. Right. From the very beginning, it's like things people say to me or something that's yeah. happened. And then, but then how do you, how do you draw the lesson out of it without it being lectury? Like, right. how do you, how do you give it? How do you give what you've learned to somebody in a way that they can just take it in and have it be in them? You know, um, it's a, it's a real challenge and it's not very fashionable. It's not like a very fashionable way to write poetry, you know, but it's what I think lasts. Mm-hmm. Like I yeah. think those are the poems that people keep with them, right? To to help them, yeah. You know? and, and that's that's good enough for me. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what the po- which poem? Well, that's what I was going to ask. I don't. Do you have your book with you? I was well, ask I, if I, you, you know, would. it's really funny. I brought I brought this one because I thought we the, might be talking about. Well, and that's the next one I was going to ask you yeah, about. Yeah, but see, me, that's me, the one. That book right there that you just held up is the one that I've never read, but had my, I mean, I've been read too. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, yes. I hear that it, yes. it might be a favorite it, of it, reading it, too. It, let, me, yeah. let, me, let, me, let me grab, <laughs> let me grab Magnified um, from over okay. here. And then I want to, I'm really, well, actually, you know, what would be best? I don't know if you feel like whether you could do this or not. But do you think you could read it to me? I could, and and I was curious about where whether my meter was, you know, whether I'm doing. Oh, it right. doesn't but matter. It None of that. I can matter. give it up. <laughs> but and if I can make it through without crying. Well, that's okay. It's okay to cry because I cry all the time when I read. Just right. hold the book up so people can see the. Oh sure. The so this is a picture. This. And we'll have a. Oh, I want to get ah, it. it's a kind of shiny. Yeah. There we go. It's a picture there of Niagara. It, 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 it's a picture, picture of, of, Niagara Niagara of Niagara Falls. Falls. Right. Leslie stood. Um, the Canadian side, I held under her belt so she would not fall over. I love it. <laughs> and so you can see the mist below. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because it's that this talks about the falls. The um, the one I opened up to, and I just keep coming back to it, is called The Spin, The Dip. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, I don't know if I can start it. Poof. All right. Um, okay. Maybe it's not fair to ask you to read it. No, 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 it's okay. Is it okay? I think I can do it. Yeah, okay. I just have to take a breath. <laughs> okay, wait, you know what? Let me get my copy so that if you have to stop, I can pick it up. Oh, okay. All right. This is being a really great interview. It's not, you know, I can get up in the middle of it and go get my book. Tell me what page, <laughs> tell me what page you're 31. on. 31. To spin the dip. Okay, I'm with you. Okay. I don't want life to end with you, so I say, we never took those dance lessons. The spin, the dip. There'll always be something not yet done. One more trip to Niagara to see the falls, or one more trip to see the falls fall. I dreamed you said, let's go over together. And I said, but I would die. Not you, not you. Dying in the dream, not you. 
We had the talk about ashes, named the North and South rivers to be sprinkled with us like pollen, specks to meet again in some thunder crowd. Our boom, zigzag, bloom. Can we go see the falls? You will smile at me in a thunder. See, I can't, ooh, sorry. <laughs> I know. That's how I feel about Ooh, it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. no. um, you will smile at me in the thunder. And I will not yet be pouring you through my hands. Chalky bone dust. Disappearing into the mist. Eternal, beautiful. Disembodied matter. Not yet. Not you. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> That was perfect. It was a perfect reading. You, you should never, never feel like you don't know poetry to read a poem like that. Wow. You should always feel like you know poetry. Yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> that's crazy. But that's the first poem I opened the book to. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, holy smokes. <laughs> so yeah um, yeah this is what and this is the book I mean it is yeah. you know so when you were talking about poetry um you know what how it makes people feel uh, it puts people off it shuts people out you know the, uh, I think that's the poetry of the bourgeois owning class <laughs> world but the poetry for us for us regular folks it's not like that. That's my right. poetry. Yeah. And I wrote this book when Leslie was really sick. And I did not know how I was going to live without her. Well, and we also just didn't know what was going to happen. Right. And it was really hard. I, I was working, I had a job, it was very demanding, and I was taking care of her. We had grandchildren, it was very hard. So I would go out, not every day, but as often as I could to walk in the morning. And I just said to myself, you can just go out and, think, and, and just find something that you want to write about or I mean that's that's even too fancy just yeah. look around there's got to be something there for you that has meaning that's really what it was like there's got to be something out there that has meaning for you right. something so what is it today yeah. you know sometimes it was just like a bag of trash there's a poem in here about a bag <laughs> of trash. seriously yeah, sometimes it, it was like that yeah. right yeah and I would just try to find one, one thing. And then I would walk and I would just try to make a little bit of a poem about it. Right. And then I'd come it. back and I'd write it down. And I did that for years. Like the, the first of these was written in like maybe 2011, maybe earlier. Cause there, so there are hundreds of hundreds of them. And this is just the ones that I decided were would do would do what that did to you, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Like, I tried to just keep those, um, and they were about, you know. There's just a cup. There's a poem at the beginning about hearing somebody singing a song called "Oh Death," just an old Appalachian folk hymn. And then a poem about me and Leslie meeting. And then the third poem is, that's the spring we learned you were going to die. You know, we understood or we learned you were going to die. And then the whole, the whole book is really about um, still loving and living in the middle of dying and going on. Yeah. And going on. Um, Well, it's interesting to me because I've had a lot of death in my life and I, you know, I, I think we're all just walking each other home all the time anyway. And yet there is something really powerful about having that experience with someone um, that yes. I'm sure changes you forever. Oh, you yes. Know, it's like that part of your life is her death. I think it changes 
anytime you you love somebody like that it, not as a lover even necessarily you just right. love them right sure and you you go with them to the edge of death literally yeah. like you're at the lip of death but you they go over and you do not yeah it changes everything mm -hmm. um it just changes everything and uh, it's taken me quite a, I mean, I still, you know, it's, it's still very hard every day without Leslie, but it, it, it took me some years before I could even just sort of be in the world, you sure. know, like, like you, you're, you're just in another world where there's death and life and other things aren't so important, you know, but I had yeah. the book, I had the pawns. You know, I'm working on another book right now. I think, Great. you know, this might be something, this is sort of for the, the people who, or whose stories are primary and not poems, maybe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I started it, I started it about 10 years ago when we were fighting for so-called same-sex marriage, right? Right. Uh, and I wanted to write about marrying leslie which was you know we did ourselves we right. didn't wait for the state <laughs> right we, we we did too we had a big wedding that was, we didn't yeah. wait for the state to okay it <laughs> it was I not legal to, <laughs> right right but i wanted to i wanted to do a portrait of a marriage you know uh, i wanted to do the story of how complicated because of, of what you were saying about it's not just about sexuality it's also about gender mm -hmm. So I've been writing it for a long time. I just keep writing it. And then right before Leslie died, we were, you know, we were dealing with her work. How was her work going to continue? These poems, there was a point at which she couldn't read them anymore. I, I was, I had been giving them to the drafts, the daily drafts to her. And there was a point at which she said, I can't, I can't read them anymore. It's too sad. Um, and I gave her a, a, a bit of a draft of this marrying Leslie, but it was right after the, um, the uh, I guess it, it must have been right after the reversal of the sodomy laws. No, no, that was 2004. So it must have been, oh, they were legalizing marriage in a few states, Massachusetts and so on, and we got married, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was happening. And um, I gave her the, 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 just a very short version of some of that writing about the marrying. And she read it and she said, you know, you're just gonna have to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how we were with each other, <laughs> right? She's like dying. And she's saying about, and this work that's about our loving each other. She was like, you're just going to have to start all, all, over, again. all over again, which, of course, she was right. I mean, she was talking about the political situation, but she was talking about everything. Right. Sure. So I'm 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 really it's really turned into quite an endeavor. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm still in the middle of it. Yeah. Or in the end of it or something. I don't know. But it's for it's meant to be. Um, it's meant to disclose some of the things that we've been talking about in story form. Right. Not just abstractly, but like we were walking down the sidewalk in the in the village, and these gay guys set firecrackers off by our feet and called us breeders. And I almost, you know, and I started screaming at them, and then, <laughs> you know, like the ways we got seen from the outside and what was really happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I'm constantly holding on to the hope because of this new world of, of, of my kids who are 12 and say pooey on all that mess of gender. And at the same time, I am, I'm, um, you know, sometimes I get nervous because 
just like you said, all you mentioned all of those movements, and now we're seeing all this regression. And you know, you uh, just last week we had the abortion Roe versus Wade starting to get challenged and all of that stuff. How do you keep yourself focused forward and like focusing on the hope and the difference we make? And it's oh, it's such an important question because really we are in a particularly bad moment. Um, the right wing has out organized the left wing in this country because they were organizing at the community level around the school boards, boards of education, county commissioners, um, state houses, you know, in certain parts of the country, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to remember what we have won and that the reason there is being a backlash is because we won. Thank you, yes. We won and not only did we win legally, which they may be trying to overturn and they may, you know, they may overturn it. But just like Leslie and I married each other without benefit of clergy or state, we were we are all gonna live our lives that way. That's right. They made, they made abortions illegal. Underground women feminist, you know, networks have been trying to figure out how to deal with this for years. Right. I don't know anything about that, but I'm sure people are going to be taking care of people. Right. You know? I mean, California is already becoming a sanctuary state where yep. you yep. can go there and have an abortion because it's they're gonna, not, you know, not going to do We it. know how to do this and That's we right. have done it. Thank you. Yes. We have done it before. We can we can mount a counteroffensive. Mm -hmm. Um they want us to be discouraged. They want us mm. to doubt ourselves. We really, and, and more than anything, we have to look at these new generations. Right. I mean, they're just, and what's really interesting to me about the organizing is the new generation that's multi-gender and multinational and multi-sexual and multi-everything, where are they coming together? In the workplace. Yeah. In the workplace. In other words, that connection that they can have because they're not letting these other divisions dominate their lives. Right. Male, females, gay, straight. No. So what do they have in common? They're all at Starbucks together. The boss is brutalizing them and their life cannot be as good as they want it to be. And because those other divisions have been put to the side, not because they're not there, but because they know they have to be in solidarity with each other. Mm. Yeah. They, they know, they've learned, the movements that I talked about at the beginning that, that, that from the 50s on have brought those lessons forward over and over and over again in our lives, in the school curriculum, in public you know, monuments. They know all that and they know if they're going to be strong, they have to be respectful of each other, caring of each other and in solidarity with each other. And they're doing it. They are. Yeah, they're, they're doing it. And, it, and it's and, and who knows how far that's going to go. Yeah, you know? I agree. And I, agree. I think I think we've got to got to let our hope blossom. I agree. And I know that, you know, I. I'm a, as in terms of my business, you know, I'm an executive coach and I teach a lot about what we focus on always gets bigger. And that's why I'm focusing on love. That's why I'm focusing on my stories and staying in my lane. Uh, now I would love them to keep telling people not to say gay because keep doing that. <laughs> You're they're so right. dumb. Keep saying, don't say gay. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> These people are so dumb. <laughs> I know, I know. Keep I'm, doing that. Tell people not to say gay all day. Tell them not to think about it either. <laughs> I like over and over and over, over again. Over and over and over again. We can sort of tell what's on their minds. Can't <laughs> <we>? <laughs> I know. Gay, 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 gay. <laughs> I know. It's uh, so sad. Honestly, it is. it's, it's so, so silly. Sad. If they weren't, <laughs> if they weren't in power, it would be so sad. Right. You know? <laughs> that's true that's true as it is um, it's just mean and hateful yeah yeah and i mean you know never before just like always in all of our movements you know the what i'm what i'm here for is is that 
there's always going to be there's you and there's Leslie and there's me and there's you know that that there's always been the pioneer who is out there willing to be bold enough to say this is my authentic self and this is who I am and you know I'll never some of the most valuable story I have is the day that a 16 year old you know 15 year old and the 16 year old trans kid came up to me and said you're the only old trans guy we know (laughs) (laughs) I was 42 at the time (laughs) but my heart burst open because what I knew at the time was that what they were seeing is what they were saying to me is I don't see me in the world right so thank you for being visible thank you for being out thank you for being someone who is there for me because i need to see myself in the world and, and you're still alive and they i'm still alive <laughs> they could see a future right and i have kids and a wife and i'm happy and i have my own business and yeah i have a future right where i didn't see that me growing up i didn't see my future anywhere there was nobody that looked like me right there was nobody that i could relate to um right. so that's my my hope and my focus is that we're and and the fact that they're so loud they're like cornered cats <laughs> like they're so scared you know that you you can't I get know. that you, you got to be really scared and freaked out to be as that you I know, know that, i know but that you know violent and weird so i know i know that's true but there's a point at which and i say this as somebody who was raised under segregation where there were a lot of scared racists too but the damage that they did that's in true. their fear that's was true. real right so these 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 folks they don't deserve um you know we can understand it we can mm-hmm. wish they could have a better life right they do not deserve any mercy around what they're doing to us right they do not they do not they are they're they, you know mm-hmm. they're really doing their best to to kill people yeah well and and met if, or you know they're pushing against us right and what we know is that that just makes us come stronger yeah that's <laughs> I mean, right that's right, right. And what you resist right. and, persists and they're pushing against right. us and that's just gonna barrel over us. you know not to just, mention better dressed and funnier too right <laughs> <laughs> stronger more absolutely. stylish <laughs> absolutely with way more flair <laughs> so thank you for coming on the gender reveal party oh, podcast this I'm, has been wonderful yeah oh my gosh i'm just over the moon <laughs> so, oh, well thr- how wonderful thrilled. to get to laugh and cry together yeah thank you thank you thank you for thank all you, of it thank you jay thank, thank you, you and i hope lots friend. of people listen to this conversation because i believe it will give them hope i hope so too I hope so yeah. too. Is there a place where we can find you uh, besides what they were going to send? Oh, oh, you that? know, people and... should. I'm on Twitter at, um, at MB Pratt, right? Okay. And I'm on Facebook as me. Uh, okay. I put poems up every Thursday. I put a poem up every oh, Thursday. That's awesome. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much, you know, if you tune in on Thursdays, you'll You'll see that I'm, my page is like, I can't friend, you know, it's like I'm maxed down on friends, but you could just follow me and yeah. you know, see the poems. And um, oh, and people should know if you're looking for for uh, books, uh, a really wonderful place to go is Caris C H A R I S Caris Books and More. They're in the Atlanta area. It's the okay. oldest feminist bookstore in the South. Awesome. Oh, so wow. That's beautiful. give them give them your business because they're still there. They That's indeed brilliant. are still there as we well. We will. And right. we'll make sure to post that link uh, to that. So, that would be great. That would be great because yeah. they they really they're they're not going anywhere. But, you know, they need all the support they can get. Right. Yes. Local bookstores. Definitely. And especially those. That's how I you know the first time somebody called me baby butch. I just walked into a lesbian feminist bookstore and <laughs> I found home right there right, so, right. Yeah. that's how i feel about Karis. they were my first they were my first bookstore yeah right. i i guess we feel about our first feminist or queer bookstores like we feel about our first lovers right right yeah <laughs> exactly all exactly. right jay it's been really great oh my gosh it's so it's great really Thank really you great so, so we're gonna say goodbye now absolutely right. love you bye hey thanks for listening to the gender reveal party podcast i hope you loved it And if you did, would you take a second and go do all the things like subscribe, rate, review, tell all your friends. Apparently, if you do that, the podcast platforms are more likely to share it. And if you think these stories are important, please take three minutes 
to just go do that. I'd really appreciate it. Also, I'd love to connect with you on social. On Instagram and Facebook, I'm at the Gender Reveal Party. And on Twitter, I'm at Prior J. It's a real joy and privilege to bring you this podcast. Come back soon. Love you, bye. Bye.